entitled uh, The New Law. If you've ever watched a uh, Western, you've probably heard this phrase. There's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> it's heard in the movies of the Old West. The implication is that with the new sheriff, things are going to be different. The law is going to be enforced. The town is going to be cleaned up. There's a new sheriff in town. Even today when someone tries to uh, unseat the sheriff in a political contest, the challenger usually points to the failures of the old regime as a reason to elect him or her. After all, I'm going to clean this place up. But let's face it. Enforcing the law is generally a thankless job, in part because the people who uh, go into law enforcement rarely see the law-abiding citizen. When they pull someone over, when they're interacting with citizens, it's generally because they've done something wrong. And they're not always happy to see the police officer pull them over, yank them out of their house, pull the weapon on them, and tell them, that they're under arrest or that they're going to get a ticket. It's hard for the authorities to catch the random criminal because it's random. If there's a pattern, they can find it. If there's a pattern, they can figure it out. And then when they do, they're overjoyed with having closure. The families have closure, resolution. And the instrument that has brought peace, the officer, the person of the law, is often forgotten because we're rejoicing over the thing that has happened. The Jews had trouble. First, they had been given this huge stack of laws that they had to watch under. If you've ever gone back and read the law of Moses, and then you went and read the Mishnah, which is the interpretation of that law. Bigger, broader, more expansive than the law. And then you, you were to live in Jesus' day, and each one of the scribes or the Pharisees who had a new version of the interpretation expanded and expounded on what was already given. It's a heavy load of Jews. There were lots of them. They were uh, typically in that day they were called lawyers. How wonderful that we continue that tradition. The burden placed on the people was enormous, and even a faint whisper of sin in someone's life could ruin them. Think about it. If there were a Pharisee or a scribe or a teacher of the law who thought that your family or you had violated some interpretation that they had given, they began preaching bad about you and your business might be ruined. Everybody would go, I don't want to go over there. You know, that teacher, that lawyer over there is talking bad about him. And if I go over and visit his business, he may think I'm in cahoots with him. It could ruin your family because if your in-laws didn't like you anyway and someone started saying that you were a sinner, there's a good reason for them not to go to your house for Christmas dinner anymore. Your reputation could be ruined. And even worse, if you were accused of something really bad, you know, they could just haul you off and stone you. They could get a mob up and pick up rocks and kill you right there, even though the Roman law didn't allow them to execute anyone. Into this social dynamic, Jesus steps. As a teacher, as a leader, as a rabbi, they expected him to begin teaching his own version, own interpretation. Law. And his message is radical for those who were there. He has a power that no one has ever seen or experienced. 
Surely he will teach his disciples to keep the law according to his interpretation. But listen to what he says in verse 17, Matthew chapter 5. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now it's easy for us to understand the fulfillment of prophecy. What Isaiah said about Jesus came to pass. What the other prophets said about Jesus has come. Jesus exemplifies them. If you went back and look at all the prophecies about Messiah in the Old Testament and compare them to Jesus, you would see that Jesus has become already what they prophesied would be. We can go through them 400 years before his birth. And we can see that Jesus exemplifies, has fulfilled all of those promises. But how can someone fulfill the law? First, Jesus fulfilled the law in this. By living each and every day according to the true provisions of the law. Jesus never sinned, which means Jesus never broke the law. In this way, he fulfilled the law. But second, Jesus shed new light for understanding the law as well. The law was interpreted in that day in behaviors. Many of the modern theologians of that day interpreted the law as they saw fit, and you had to do what they said was right, and you had to do the things that they thought were right, and you had to avoid the things that they thought were wrong. This law or that law was often seen as more important than another. And it's okay to violate some of the lesser laws, but don't violate the really important ones. Jesus puts his foot down and says, Not the smallest letter or the least stroke of a pen will disappear until everything written in the law is accomplished. Many will say that the law is out of fashion, or that the law has passed from application. And possibly for the Christian, it has. Paul says to us that you and I who have become Christians no longer live under the law, but have passed from the law into grace. God's gift to us. Grace is God granting us what we could not obtain without His help. Yet the law is still operational for those who have refused His grace. The law and every violation of the law will be enforced, if not in this life, then in the judgment that is to come. Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law. And He will, not when He came as Savior, but when He comes again as judge, He will fulfill the law. And then let's look at some examples that he gives. Now Jesus says this, and you can, you can point to it. Jesus says, you have heard it said, and he quotes the law, or the modern interpretation of the law. And then he says, but I tell you. Now he's bringing in the fulfillment of it. In uh, verses 21 through 26, he talks about murder. And I'm going to lump that together with 38 and 42, where he talks about revenge. Jesus pressing the issue on murder. He said, you have said, you heard it said, do not murder. The fulfillment of the command comes not in the behavior, but rather in the attitude. Jesus said, technically, even to be angry enough to call someone a name is to be guilty of the intent of the law. If you say, you're a fool, you stupid idiot, you've just murdered in your heart. Jesus, Jesus takes it to a whole new level. It's not so much that the law was no longer in operation with behavior, but it's further than that. It's deeper than that. It's the attitude. The law was intended to penetrate deep into humanity. 
deeper than behavioral prohibitions. It was intended that the law would infect and affect our attitudes. After all, which comes first, the thought and the attitude or the behavior? Before anything happens, we think about it. Before we do anything, we plan our course. It doesn't just happen. It starts in our mind and in our heart. The idea of a thought life then leads to reconciliation between parties. But before, Jesus said, before you can be justified before God, before you take your offering to the altar in verse 23, you need to be living right with one another. How can you say, John, interpreting, interpreting Jesus' interpretation, John in 1 John chapter 4 verse 20 says, How can you say you love God, whom you have not seen, and hate your brother, whom you have? Then in verses 34 through 42, he speaks of revenge, an eye for an eye. Our first desire, Jesus says, should be to demonstrate the love of God and not to assert our rights. We don't give back as good as we get. The law of love says you give what you want to receive. In fact, God has been so patient with us. And he has endured such ill treatment from us that we should be willing to go the extra mile with those who try us and test us and annoy us and challenge us. Those who mistreat us as well. Verses 27 through 32, Jesus speaks of adultery and divorce. Jesus doesn't stop with the anger that we might feel. He moves forward to lust. Committing adultery has less to do, Jesus said, with the act of adultery and more to do with the attitude that permits one to think about leaving their spouse in search of fulfillment in other places. The sin begins again in the mind and in the heart. And one of the reasons that God dislikes divorce so much is that it breaks the bonds of covenant. Marriage is a covenant relationship. It's not a contract. A contract is just a legally binding agreement between two parties. But a covenant is deeper and more profound. Marriage is a pledge and a trust. It is given from one person to another. God understands the covenant relationship. He established a covenant between himself and the children of Abraham. He was to be their one and only God, and they would be honored among all the people of the world. This is why when the prophets spoke of the violations that the children of Israel had made, he called them an unfaithful wife for God. They had broken their covenant. God holds the marriage covenant in high esteem, and it is not to be trifled with lightly. Paul had trouble with a group of people in, uh, in the book of Galatians. People who wanted to live according to the law. And they wanted everyone who became a Christian to observe all of the law of Moses. They thought that the Christian had to fulfill the ceremonial parts of the law as well as the other parts. In spite of the fact that Paul had been teaching all these years about grace. Paul nailed them to the wall with this. Willis likes to quote this. The entire law is fulfilled in one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Think about that. Jesus, who was questioned by the Pharisees, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And a second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself.
says, if we want to fulfill all of the just requirements of the law, if we would just begin to treat other people the way we would like to be treated, we can fulfill everything in the law. Paul's contention and Jesus' instruction is that by loving others, even those who spitefully treat us, we are actively fulfilling the law of God. Jesus said, I've come not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. He set the standard for us. He said, do it this way. Love other people the way you would like to be loved. We can fulfill the law in our time, in our homes, in our communities, by loving like Jesus loved. Now I need you to understand this. You can't do it in your own power. It is impossible for us as human beings to fulfill the law of God without the power of God in us. There are a lot of people who try to fulfill the law, who try really hard to fulfill the law, and each of them fails miserably. But don't, don't think that it's futile in your mind and give up or stop trying to love like Jesus loved. Many have adapted this theology. They say, you know, since I can't do it, 100%, I'm not even going to try a little bit. I'm just going to go and do whatever feels best to me. And that's not the way to fulfill the law. And that's not the way to be like Jesus either. They understand that the flesh of man is not able to love, and so they appeal to grace and hope that God will just forgive them for their failures, because after all, they're not going to try This is not the way of Scripture. If you look at Romans chapter 8, and I encourage you to turn there. Paul describes the way that we are made free from the power of sin and the power of the law and the failures that come with it. This flesh. Chapter 7 talks about the flesh and about the bondage to the flesh and about the, the, the lack of power in the flesh. But chapter 8 talks about the power of God operating within us. Verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now there are many of our brothers, our friends, who believe that we're still going to sin, and they appeal to this verse. They said, you know, my sin doesn't really go count against me, because there's no condemnation for me because I'm in Jesus Christ. But they fail to read verse 2. See, if we want to understand Scripture, we have to take Scripture within the context in which it was said. It's not simply the work that Jesus has done that's forgiven our sin, but it is also the work of the Holy Spirit within us that sets us free from our enslavement to sin. Look at verse 2. It says, Because through Christ Jesus... The law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law did, verse 3, for, the, for what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. Who do not live according to the sinful nature, but live according to the Spirit. Paul goes on. He doesn't stop there. He said, if you live in the sinful nature, and if you're always trying to gratify the sinful nature, the Spirit of God is not operational in you. Those who live by the Spirit will honor the Spirit. Those who live by the flesh will honor the flesh. And so if we're constantly honoring the flesh, we're not operating in the Spirit. If we're not operating in the Spirit, Paul says, we do not belong 
We have the opportunity to live in holiness. Not because we can keep the law in our own power, but because the Holy Spirit is the power within us that enables us to resist the temptation that comes, to change our thoughts, which change our attitude, which changes our behavior, which enables us to live free and to fulfill the law and at the same time, not to violate the law. We can resist the lure of adultery because the Spirit of God is motivated to help us keep our confidence. And he is the one who controls us. This is you and I cannot, need not try to harder to live better. That sounds funny, doesn't it? Don't try harder to live better. Instead, what we need to do is surrender to the Holy Spirit, and we will live better. Amen. What do you mean, Dwayne? Well, I mean don't try. Instead, give up. Don't give up and say, well, I'm going to give up. I can't do it. Well, that's a good start, but there's one who can. And He lives in us. And He can do it. He can live free. He always has. He always will. You and I will automatically live better if we simply learn to surrender to the Spirit of God and His control. We need to be filled with the Spirit and then we'll be controlled by the Spirit. We must have the Spirit in order to fulfill the law of the Spirit. We must have the Spirit in order to love. We must have the Spirit of forgiveness in order to be able to forgive. We must be able to release our anger by allowing the Spirit to control our emotions and our minds and our innermost being. To be honest, when we run into problems is when we try to exert our control instead of allowing Him to be in. And He already knows how to fulfill the law. That's why Jesus came, was to fulfill the law and then send the Holy Spirit to be our helper so that we could, not in our own power, but through submission to His power. It's impossible to live pleasing to Him without being fully submitted to Him. And if you are fully submitted to Him, it's impossible to be displeasing to Him because He is in control. Verse 8 says, Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are, not, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. And if we would just get that into our modern day society, if we would just be willing to surrender our desires and do His. A young lady spoke to the minister about allowing God full control. She said, I dare not give my heart fully to Christ for fear that He may send me to China. That was her fear. The evangelist asked her, if some cold winter morning you should find a bird nearly frozen out your window and it allowed you to pick it up and take it into your home and care for it, what would you do with that bird? Would you warm it and feed it to care for it or would you grip it so tightly in your hand that you
I say it's the simplest command, but it's, it's the most difficult thing you will ever do without Him. Love your neighbor as yourself. And if you can do that, if you can begin and live each day loving your neighbor as you love yourself, let me tell you, that is extreme living. That is something that the world knows nothing about. That is something that they cannot understand. Because it is only by and through the Spirit that you and I have that opportunity. Would you stand and pray?